My name is Caroline Casey. I am going to describe myself because if there's anybody like me, visually impaired, you could not miss the description of the flamingo wallpaper that I am sitting in front of, very unweft. I have blonde hair, um, very unusual black uh, framed glasses and look like somebody from The Incredibles. Um, I am going to ask each of our fabulous panelists similarly to introduce themselves and the current role to which they are engaged with and also audio described so we can get a sense of who everybody is. But to briefly open, I need to explain that I am the founder of The Valuable 500. The Valuable 500 was, was established because of a startling, well, many startling stats, but 90% of the companies in the world claim they are passionate and committed to inclusion, and yet only 4% consider disability. The Valuable 500 was launched 19 months ago on the main stage of the World Economic Forum, and it is the first and only global CEO community committed to transforming disability inclusion through business leadership and opportunity. It is about leadership accountability. We are right in the middle of a time of reset, this incredible opportunity for change. This new era, this potential decade of disruption, if we use this time well. This is the opportunity for a new agenda for disability inclusion. A new agenda that gets rid of the corrosive siloed approach to corporate diversity and inclusion, which has traditionally left disability on the sidelines. It's a new agenda which moves from inspiration and charity and discretional interest to the value of the community of 1.3 billion people in the world who have a disability and the value, the enormous untouched value we have to offer through growth, insight, innovation as customers, suppliers and talent. And this new agenda needs new agents. And this conversation today, I could not be delighted to share with these four game-changing agents. So I am going to call upon the first of these. And in my sightline is K.R. Lou. Will you explain to us your role and who you are? Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Good morning. I'm, I'm on the West Coast in uh, California. Uh, my uh, name is K.R. Liu. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, I am the head of brand accessibility at Google. And my role is to really bring a disability lens into our products, into the marketing content that we create, and especially the stories that we tell so disabled people can see themselves in the work that we do um, and see themselves represented authentically in the world. And uh, to describe myself, I have uh, short blonde hair, almost as blonde as Caroline. Uh, I am wearing a black shirt and uh, I have a, a silver necklace on and some silver earrings that I always wear. Uh, and I'm super happy to be here. Thank you, K.R. Sam, Sam Latif, let us know what you're up to at the moment and what trouble you're causing. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is Sam Latif, I'm Company Accessibility Leader at Procter & Gamble. And my job is amazing. It's making our company, our products and packaging, our advertising, our partnerships, our suppliers, all accessible and disability confident so that we can serve the 1.3 or 1.85 billion people now in the world with a disability in a very delightful way. And I am wearing a grey headscarf and I have big brown eyes apparently. <laughs> and um, yeah, and that's me. I'm not wearing any earrings or jewellery today because I've just worked out. I've only got my Apple watch on. Oh, you're showing off now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sinead Burke, where are you and what trouble are you causing? 
Hello, everybody. My name is Sinead. My pronouns are she and her. Due to the joys of working from home, I am in my brother's bedroom and I'm trying as much as possible to avoid showing you his various photographs and iconography that represent <laughs> his life. I have brown hair that was once a bob, but thanks to COVID-19 is almost shoulder length. And I have brown eyes. I'm wearing a navy dress that is floral and I have no jewellery on today hi there that's interesting and june have you joined us yet june sir hello. yes june sir pong hello hi caroline and hi everyone um uh, my pronouns are uh she and her um i am uh, a black woman um to further describe i'm a dark-skinned black woman uh, i have black hair um and brown eyes I'm wearing gold earrings um, and uh, like Sinead, I'm also at home, but I'm not in my brother's bed. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Now, listen, June, we're going to start with you because uh, in, I, when we were speaking last week, you said this quote that really bothered me. You said, excluding people with disabilities is not something people are ashamed of. Oh. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, unpick this one. And particularly in your role within the BBC, mm. how are you, how, what is this about and how can we change that? Yes, of course. Um, well, first of all, Caroline, thank you so much uh, for bringing us all together to have this important conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was horrible to say it, but it's it's actually true, isn't it? If we're honest, um, if you look at all of the key underrepresented groups, there's a certain element of guilt and shame uh, around discrimination uh, where those groups are concerned, particularly, uh, obviously, uh, where race is concerned, and rightly so, um, where gender is concerned, um, our LGBTQ uh, plus brothers and sisters. Um, there, is, there is a certain level of shame when we exclude those people. It's not something, even though it happens and we know how unfair uh, our world is, still, we know we shouldn't be doing it. Where disability is concerned, and I don't often quote George W. Bush, but I will here. Um, he, he spoke about the soft bigotry of low expectations. And he spoke about it in relation to African-American kids in inner city schools. But I think it's actually even more applicable where disability is concerned. We expect so little of our disabled community. We speak to grown people, grown adults, as if they were children. And as a result of it, it's almost as if we think we're doing them a favor by infantilizing them in this way. And I think that's in part why there isn't the shame. And, and actually, if you look at it, it's so deep rooted, Caroline. When somebody falls pregnant, what's the thing that everybody says? Even if you say, what gender do you want? It's always, oh, as long as it's a healthy child. And what that means is as long as the child is not disabled. So from the beginning of life, we're making it as if this is perhaps one of the worst things you can be. And so I think we really need to just re-look at it and accept the sort of big bigotry that those that are non-disabled in our community and in our societies all have. We all have it because it's so ingrained and then we can start honestly tackling this stuff. KR, you've talked about, I mean, what you've heard June speaking about the, how people may view disability, but you've speak to that disability has so many dimensions to it. And you're using the platform within Google to change that representation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And how are you going about that? What are some of the early wins? Can we say wins or are areas of improvement? And what are the barriers for this? Yeah, absolutely. And, and June has a really good point. And there are so many different dimensions to who we are. Um, and, and myself, right, I identify as a gay woman with severe hearing loss. So there's, there's I'm not like a woman one day and disabled the next day and gay the next day. I am all those things all the time. And so at Google, my role is to really show that. Right, is to show all the dimensions of who disabled people are in the work that we do, and also include everyone in that experience. And, and one example I can I can say we started to do on that is our racial equity work that we did in June. We launched our first 
racial equity site in our racial equity video around things that are being searched for at an all time high. Um, and in that video, we made sure that we talked about the intersections of race, of gender, of LGBTQ and of disability. We made the experience the most inclusive experience we've ever done in some of our biggest campaign videos to make sure that anyone with any disability could experience that. Um, and that was a big first step, but we have many steps to go. This is something that Google is committed to doing. And, and honestly, it's been new, right? They've never had a disability lens or a disability representation in the marketing side where they can bring that voice, bring the community to the table to help make sure that we are highlighting important issues like ableism being searched at an all time high. We actually did a campaign around that for ADA 30. So we wanna start having these conversations, but also we wanna also start showing what disability looks like. And it's not just you know an older white person in a wheelchair, which is typically the standard advertisement that you see. We wanna show all the beautiful ways that disability is represented. Um, and we wanna start breaking down those barriers. We wanna start having people see the beauty of who we are and what we represent and what we stand for. And we wanna be recognized as equal members of society. That's really important to us. Uh, and that's really important to the community too, right? We wanna be able to be free to be who we are. And that's, that's the goal. And I think that moves to free to be who we are. We need to see ourselves in advertising and having products and services available. Sam, you know, you are looking at trying to make Procter & Gamble the most inclusive to all your consumers. Do you want to explain a little bit about some of the initiatives that you've been doing or some of the changes that you're seeing? Yeah, sure. So basically trying to change the mindset that disabled people have an equal right to access all of our products and services. And so, you know, in order to do that, we've had to do three things. Like, first of all, we've had a culture shift at PNG, which has prompted a cascade of new thinking and initiatives, which makes this kind of thinking a, a reality. So I, I can touch on three. Um, first, like we're becoming more disability confident in our culture. Second, we're We've started a tremendous, you know, beginning in making our products on our, on our packaging more in inclusive and accessible, easy to open, easy to use. And third, our advertising. So better reflecting and also better serving the people watching our advertising. And I think the issue of visibility and I mean, Sinead, you probably can speak to this very much at the moment. Um, it is not just enough for us to have visible role models, right? This is, this is why this conversation is so important because everybody here is working within a business or an industry. You're talking from moving from something from visibility to capability and from the individual to the collective. And you are working very closely to disrupt the fashion industry, but that's not where you're, that's where you're starting. But just explain to us what you've seen happen in your extraordinary journey in the last two years, two to three years particularly. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so honoured to be on this panel. The level of expertise and insight and disruption is just yes. so incredible to see. I am a person who has benefited from great visibility within an industry of fashion. I understood that fashion profited from a notion of exclusivity and yet I had the grandiose ambition at 15 that I wanted to make it inclusive and still have a business model by which it was profitable. Turns out it's possible. From being on the front cover of Vogue and being the first little person to do so and attending the Met Gala garnered great currency for me and the industry. For me personally, the best moments within those initiatives were not being present at the time, but in the responses that I received from families and individuals, mostly young disabled people who for the first time saw themselves reflected within popular culture and authenticated by an institution like Vogue. What made that matter was that Fashion was now ticked. That box was done. Would they be a Michelin star chef? Would they be an astronaut? But how do we make sure that success is not just for the exception, but success is the rule? How do we ensure that the culture is changing? How do we ensure that visibility is not just an immediate solution in order to garner press or marketing? How are we changing the culture? How are we providing new employment opportunities? How are we working explicitly and specifically with disabled people. We cannot design the future for disability if we do not have disabled advocates and disabled experts at the heart of shaping the solutions. To quote Audre Lorde, 
the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house. We need disabled people at the heart of all progress moving forward because otherwise we're just re-inculcating the ableist biases that exist moving forward. We are redefining the paternalistic culture, which June spoke about, where we are talking to disabled people about what they need instead of looking through a lens of accessibility to provide innovation, creativity, opportunity, and profitability in a way in which creates, as K.R. said, a safe space for people to be themselves at work, at home, and in social opportunities. So one of the, th thank you, um, all of you. By the way, if you want to interrupt each other, um, you, I won't see you, as you know, so just use your voice with, um, with some level of politeness. But uh, one of the things everybody challenges us on when we speak about disability is like, let's get granular. Tell me some ideas. Give us some best practice. Give us some learnings that are working. How do we get this from niche to normal? So are there one or two examples regardless of your own organizations or your own industries that you're, you can see that these are examples of the leadership that you want to support and see scaled are there some things that you're going this we need more of um i'm going to come to you sam because when we were speaking you we have all referred to the issue of disclosure what are you doing in PNG, or are you able to say that? Because I think this is something we all feel quite, um, this is something we feel very strong about, about identity and disclosure. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, but going back to what June said, there's, related to that, it's a fact that 65% of people say that they avoid people with disabilities because they make them feel uncomfortable. So, and this is true in my experience as well, when people first meet me, I can sense their discomfort, um, but I also know that after they've spent some time with me, that their level of discomfort goes down and they start understanding the, what the problems are when it comes to disability and accessibility. And they actually wanna start solving those problems. Um, and um, it, it's very difficult for, if, if that's if more than two thirds of the population is uncomfortable with disability, it's hard for individuals, even if companies are asking people to disclose if they have a disability voluntarily, people might still feel uncomfortable. So I think it's first of all, really important to change the culture to um, really overcome these conscious or unconscious biases that people have towards disability and the way, you know, we need to do that from like from birth, all the way through school, universities, work, workplaces, we need to get to know people with disabilities and like get comfortable around them, understand that they're just human beings like everyone else. And um, that will hopefully open people's hearts and minds and start making changes that are really needed in, in business and in society. And June, to that point, listen, you're a BBC. How can we get to change these hearts and minds? The talent behind the camera, the talent in front of the camera as a lived experience of disability. What are you guys doing about it? We're doing a lot, Caroline, and, <laughs> and a lot that I'm very proud of. Yesterday, in fact, our Director General announced um, our 50-50 project, which has been around gender um, on-screen representation um, in terms of contributors. That's now being rolled out for BAME and disability. Um, so we now have clear targets um, in terms of the disability representation from a contributor perspective, because often when you're looking at experts, back to what both um, uh, Sam and uh, Sinead and KR, what all of you were saying about changing how th those with disabilities are, or, or those uh, in our society that are uh, uh, non-abled, bodied as it were, are being treated what it, we have to do is change the overall perception, which means also showing them in the positions of leadership as experts. So when you're talking about an issue around science, why does it only have to be non-disabled people that are contributors or only white men? These are the things that we're challenging. So you're going to see a lot of representation on that front. Also, um, as you know, uh, Inclusion Month uh, is taking place throughout November at the BBC uh, and disability is our core focus. So we have a season of programming that I'm very excited about. Uh, Matt Fraser has done some fantastic stuff for us as has Ruth Maidley and many other fantastic creatives. So you're gonna see some really great content 
um, and the same with our radio programming as well. Um, and then the long, you know, and that's kind of the first steps, isn't it, really? That's kind of just step one. And then it's the long-term stuff, which is who's writing a show? And are we only expecting those in our society with disabilities to only write storylines that are about those? Uh, no, let's move beyond that. Who's writing the show? Who's directing the show? Who is actually commissioning the show? So these are the things that we are working on, but those things take longer. But at least in terms of representation, we can deal with that pretty quickly. So and now I'm, well, Sinead, you and I know each other anyway, but now <laughs> Sam and, and obviously Caroline, I adore you. But now Kay and Sam, I'm going to be harassing you all as well in terms of coming on our shows as contributors. So. Yes, me too, me too. <laughs> well, well, KR, KR, you, I, I've been wondering about you. Are, have you found yourself in the kind of only bracket? You, do you know what I mean? Within the organizations that you've been in before at Google, are, do you see more people now coming out of every closet that there is and advocating, <laughs> you know, because I say I came out of the disability closet. Are you seeing that happening more? People are more comfortable to identify and disclose, you know, how is, how are you seeing that change? Yeah, I would definitely say COVID has absolutely helped that actually. Um, <laughs> people have been coming out more and, and identifying with disability, having conversations with it, understanding that disability isn't like, you know, physical or um, just a visible disability. And what's been interesting at, at Google and in the industry on the tech side, at least that I've seen is more people with disability being, being put in positions of leadership, being put in positions of decision-making to make actual changes, to help guide the organizations into how they can be more inclusive of people with disabilities. Uh, and even in my own organization, I've been very grateful to have leadership that's given me a platform and a voice to be able to talk about the things I want to see change, how we can be better about the work that we create, how we can bring a platform to the people that I've created and innovated in this space. Disabled people have done amazing things in technology and nobody knows about those stories and I want to tell those stories. And to June's point, getting disabled creatives behind the camera, writing the storyline, producing the content, being a director, that needs to happen as well because who better to tell our stories than our community themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's also important because I wanna change the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate for people with disabilities is insane in the US and it's insane around the world. And there's a huge pipeline of talent that we can really help bring to the table and work from home has actually shown that that is possible. You can be productive working from home. I'm actually more productive working from home. Um, <laughs> And so it created a lot of open-mindedness now to start allowing people to speak up, say what they need, and to look at other areas of the business, not just in tech. Don't just look at product development. Don't just look at engineering. Look at the whole creative side from the time you talk about the idea all the way through the story you're going to tell to the world. The disabled community needs to be involved in that entire process, and that's my goal. Which is a lovely segue to Sinead, because... Sinead has many projects and initiatives up her sleeve. Sinead, just as we come to the close of these last ones and everybody get ready for your very quick fire last question. Sinead, you've been doing a lot in developing your engagement with business leadership. Do you want to talk through some of them that go beyond what you're best known for around fashion? Absolutely. I have a company called Tilting the Lens. It is a consultancy and communications based company to really reshape fashion systems, product and education around designing through a lens of accessibility. So KR, you've brought up such an incredible and important point in relation to thinking about innovation through a lens of disability, that it's not just within engineering, it's not just within product development. Within a fashion system, there has been huge demand for adaptive clothing, which is designing clothes for people with disabilities for such a long time. My argument is not to do it, at least not in the lens in which we're currently thinking it through. If we go back a couple of decades, the plus size community for a long time asked for fashion to respect them and to provide clothes for them. Fashion's response was to do it, but not really to include those who describe themselves as plus size as fat. So what was provided was a segment of the market that was limited in aesthetic, in product offering and in business opportunity. 
If there are women or those who choose to wear dresses on this call, you will be very familiar with having at least once in your life having had to sleep in a dress. And that is because the zip is at the back. That is how you know it was designed by a man who wasn't wearing it. What disabled people need is to remove the dress from the back and instead to use Velcro or magnets as a ceiling. What disabled people need is three pillars change within fashion. Fixture, so again, not zips. Function and texture in terms of if you are autistic or if you have various different sensitivities, you need different types of fabric. Again, that benefits everybody. And lastly, alterations. I'm a little person, which means I need the sleeves and the trousers and various other items of mine altered. Alterations is a medical word. Let's translate that into a fashion lexicon, customization. These are all skills that the fashion industry are very, very familiar with. So how do we adapt them? Not just for a disabled market, but use the learnings from the disabled experience to innovate the entire business model. How else then do we market the story? How else then do we include the accountants, the legal, the finance and the operations? I want to create a new system within an archaic one where disability innovation and inclusivity is at its heart and is intersectional from the very beginning. Can well, like, I just interrupt? You can. You get 30 <laughs> seconds to say what she said. And, yeah. and actually, universal design yes. is precisely that. And everybody benefits. We've seen it with every other form of universal design. Everyone benefits in the end. So hear, hear, Sinead. Well, I think this is a thing that all four of you are complete, committed advocates around human-centered design, which is everything about this reset is the human is at the center, the full human. Now I'm getting waves on my phone. You get, each of you, we have all of the CEOs of all the leaders in all the world, and you get a declaration of disruption, which we want to use to take through to our outcome session. You have each of you 45 seconds or whatever, but not beyond. I will take this and this is what from you want to see in this reset with no more excuses. So June, you're on. Okay, 45 seconds. Well, 45 I, seconds. I would say value and values. So we need to be very clear of what our values are. And I think once we are clear about our values and make sure that inclusion or, or, or humanity, as you say, Caroline, is at the center of that, then who we value changes. And at the moment, there are so many people in society that we don't value, and they know we don't value them. And therefore, we are getting just a fraction of what it is that they have to contribute to this world. So I think if we change our values, it will change who we value. And as a result, everybody benefits. Nice. KR, you're on. Oh, so hard to answer I that. know, I mean, I mean, but come on. No, I, I think if anything, we need to recognize, like I said earlier, the contributions that disability has done, given to the world and innovation um, and show that when you do include people with disabilities, it is good for everyone. It's good business. It's inclusive. It shows you a whole nother way of how people don't typically have to adapt to this world and we do. And so it benefits everyone because everyone at some point in their lifetime will be disabled. They will be. So why not build a world that includes us? Because it will benefit you in the end. It will benefit everyone. So it's really important that people need to recognize that disability touches all of us at some point in our lifetime. You're absolutely right. Future proofing the future of everyone. Sam. So I might say that I, might, I want to give these leaders something practical that they can take away and implement. And one of the things that's very dear to my heart is the lovely content that June and KR are talking about creating and developing by people with disabilities. My dream is that people with disabilities can actually watch that content, and especially if they're blind, through a service called Audio Description. And it's quite sad that in the world today that most of the content around the world collectively is not audio described, which means that blind people cannot see that content with just a very little minor investment of less than a couple of hundred pounds, companies can make their content audio described and it makes the world of difference to the 285 blind people or a million blind people around the world. So definitely go do audio description and, and especially in countries where it doesn't even exist and blind people have never even experienced it. Brilliant. 
Thank you, Sam. Sinead, you got to roll us out because we're going to go from you into the members' conversation. So give us the drum roll. I want you to ask yourself three questions. Who is not in the room? Whether that's your boardroom, design studio, commissioning, office. Who is not there? Number two, is your room accessible, be it digital or a physical space? Is your office in an historic and architecturally protected building that cannot be made accessible? Is your Zoom or Microsoft Teams call closed captioned? Do you have sign language interpreters and are you alerting the accessibility accommodations that you are providing in the outset and in the invitation of the meeting? And the third one, do you have accessible pathways by which you can change the trajectory of your company, your culture, and the impact that you can have on community and the world as a whole forevermore? Guys, we are the best panel. Now stay here, everybody. Can I just say, can we all give a wave for, the, for this one? Thank you. 